It is a bright spring morning. And I have driven about an hour northwest of Toronto to the tiny community of Kleinberg. Where the Humber River meanders through, the water slowly making its way south to Lake Ontario. My name is Austin Delaney, and I'm a reporter with CTV Toronto. And for more than 30 years, I have covered crime and the court cases that follow. I find myself not far from the village's main street, Kleinberg, mostly famous for its Group of Seven art collection housed at the McMichael Gallery. It is also where the body of a young mother was found stuffed in a suitcase. Today, I am here to meet with CP24's crime analyst, Steve Ryan, a former detective sergeant with Toronto's Homicide Squad. Hey, Steve. Hey. So this is the case that ended your career, really, as a, as a homicide officer. It was. It was, um, yeah, the last case where... I decided I was not going to see another, I could not see another body in a suitcase and I left the job uh, within five months of this investigation. It's that traumatic? It was terrible. Yeah, it was a terrible case. It's hard to describe what it, it looks like when you see um, a human being stuffed in a suitcase. And uh, to see that on a couple of occasions within a span of a, you know, a few months because of the case I had prior to when I was at trial, um, yeah, it was it for me. It was just that the grief was just too much. The court case the former homicide cop is referring to is the Bitter Singh case. 17-year-old Melanie, tortured, beaten and starved, found in a burning suitcase, she weighed just 50 pounds. Her father and stepmother eventually convicted of her murder. Melanie Bitter Singh lived a life of horror and now her father will live his life in prison. But today we are here to talk about the Dr. Ilana Frick Shamji murder whose body was also found stuffed in a suitcase and thrown into the river. I would imagine it's hard to even put a body into a suitcase. It's difficult, but you'd be surprised uh, just how a body can bend and twist to get into a suitcase. And the suitcase that uh, uh, this woman was put into was not that big of a suitcase, but he managed, uh, he being her husband who killed her, uh, managed to get her into that suitcase. The killer is Dr. Alana Frick Shamsi's husband, Dr. Mohammed Shamsi, a 43-year-old renowned neurosurgeon with a history of violence at home directed at his wife during their 12 years of marriage. It was December 1, 2016, sometime between midnight and 1 a.m., and Dr. Shamsi was driving all over the back roads north of the marital home in Toronto looking for a place to hide the body when he came upon a small bridge on Nashville Road crossing the Humber River here in Kleinberg. How did he pick this spot to dump the body? That was a question I was hoping uh, that he would answer for me, and I did interview him, but he didn't uh, say anything to me. Um, this is an odd spot. It's not a busy, busy place, that's for sure. So after he was arrested, we did a search warrant and got his phone records. And he is all over the place up here. So I just get, I've got the impression that he was driving everywhere trying to find a spot. He left his three kids at home, babies by themselves. So he, picture this, he's got his dead wife in his car and he's looking to dump her body. So we had him all the way over at Highway 50, driving up and down 50, coming along Nashville Road here. And I guess he just picked this spot here because he's heading to the 27 Highway and then he's heading back home. So this was the... Uh, a spot that I think he picked just out of pure panic and he just tossed her body over the bridge. What was he looking for for a place? Like, where, where does one dump a body? Great question. You, you, one tries to dump a body, and I, I just say this based on people I've interviewed in the past, where they cannot be found. But clearly, you can be found in, this, in, this, uh, in the Humber River here where, where he threw her body. So, you know, you given the fact that this man was a neurosurgeon, brilliant academically, not so brilliant when it came to covering up a crime. We walk along the concrete bridge that spans the Humber River and imagine what the killer was thinking. 
his wife's dead body in a suitcase, his three children alone at home, his eldest daughter aware something bad has happened. We lean on the railing and look down. If you think of where her body was found, which is just below us here, part, partly submerged in the water, it would make the most sense that he pulled his car over in a panic. And I don't believe he was familiar with this area because there's only two feet of water and it's always been two feet of water. I mean, nobody throws a body in two feet of water if you're trying to get rid of a body. So I don't think he knew the area. It was dark, it was a panic. He'd been driving around for some time. He picked the spot, threw her over, not knowing where she was going to end up. And she ended up partially submerged in the water and partially on the land. I don't think he knew that either. And he just drove off and went back home. Let's go have a look where the body's found. Okay. Be careful on your way down. Yeah. We crawled over the guardrail just past the bridge. It is a steep decline down a grassy hill to where the water is, to where the body was found. It's a pretty slippery slope going it down sure here, is. isn't it? It sure is. He probably would have been better off if he'd brought the case down here. Yeah, well, you can see this is all open, so he was probably better off if he, well, if he didn't kill her, number one, but yep. if he's going to try to get rid of evidence, this is not really not the ideal place to do it because it's all wide open. And people walk through here. We make it to lower ground and to the river's edge, to where the suitcase was discovered and where the killer left investigators a calling card. How was she found? So a fireman, uh, I believe, was walking his dog down here, and he came across the suitcase the morning uh, after she'd been dropped over the bridge. And he called the police because he found it suspicious. Police attended, opened the suitcase, and found this uh, a badly beaten body of, uh, of a woman in the suitcase. So they began their investigation to try to identify who she was. But identifying her was pretty easy because of the suitcase alone. So her name, believe it or not, was on the suitcase and her address was on the suitcase. Again, this goes back to the panic that he was, he was in because he clearly thought none of this through because everything he touched um, was a clue for us. And uh, yeah, he left uh, her, his wife's dead body in a suitcase with her name and address on it. By now, Alana's mother was worried. She could not get hold of her daughter and phoned a missing persons report. The fact that her name was on the suitcase, did that really make it easy for everybody? Well, we knew what we were working from at that point in time. We still had to do an identification. So we did have her name and we had mom who gave us her, her daughter's name, which matched on the suitcase. Still had to show mom a picture of her. So we showed her a picture of, because uh, we needed to know one way or the other, is it her daughter or isn't it? We showed her a picture of uh, her daughter uh, from the morgue, uh, just from her, her basically from her, her chest up. And uh, she was almost unrecognizable, but her mom did recognize her. But I'll never forget when mom saw that picture, she dropped on her knees and said, uh, that's not her, it doesn't look like her, it doesn't look like her. And her husband said, it's her, it's her. And that's how we knew. It didn't take long for Detective Sergeant Steve Ryan to put two and two together, and he started covering his bases. I took the case over um, right away and had surveillance put on her husband. And I, you do that because any time you have a homicide, you have to look at the intimate partner. You have to clear them. They're not saying they're always responsible, but you have to look there first. And the more I looked at him with his post-defense conduct, what he was doing, the more I came to be convinced that he was, in fact, the person responsible. We climb back up the hill to the roadway and cross the bridge back to our cars. We leave Kleinberg and head to the city. We are going to the scene of the crime. A quiet residential neighborhood in North York, filled with bungalows and new builds where bungalows used to be. The Shamji home was one of those new builds, two stories, brick and stone. This is a house, big, beautiful house like this. 
One of the things you talk to any homicide investigator, uh, past or present, they'll tell you that after doing a couple of homicides, you quickly learn that things aren't always as they appear. For instance, you look at this beautiful house. You've got a couple, attractive couple, both at the height of their careers, both doctors, successful doctors, three beautiful kids. They'd be the envy of a lot of people, you'd think, but she was living a life of hell with regards to um, what he was doing to her um, as far as abusing her physically over and over and over again. A house of horrors. House of horrors, absolutely. And it's a house of horrors that looks like this. A seemingly idyllic life in this upscale, family-friendly neighborhood where Range Rovers appear to be the norm. But neither Mohammed Shamji nor his wife Alana were happy in their marriage, and both doctors were having affairs. Her husband eager to point the finger at Alana's lover. She had, was starting to, to see a, a man, and his name came up because when the uh, missing persons report was taken by the police and they interviewed Mohammed, her husband, he said that the last time he saw her was that Wednesday night when she left with her boyfriend. He provided us with a name, and we had to follow up on that. As, as uh, uncomfortable as that was, you always have to look at your alternate suspects. As a homicide detective, you need to look down the road. What is going to be a defense? Well, the defense is going to be I didn't do it, this guy did it. So we had to contact him. And as you can imagine, he was quite upset because his wife didn't know what was going on. And he provided us with an alibi, but then we had to talk to his wife. So we gave him a bit of time to speak with his wife and settle that with her. And then we had to talk with her because we needed an alibi from him. And he was upset when we contacted him, but I said to him, if we don't do this now, you're gonna be the prime suspect come trial time. You'll be in the witness box forever. They're gonna accuse you of all kinds of things. So we need to firm up your alibi right now as uncomfortable as this is and it was an affair so he would he wanted to keep it quiet he did he wanted to keep it quiet his wife knew nothing about it so we gave him time to tell her and then we had to talk to her afterwards because we needed to interview her the murder took place in the master bedroom on the top floor the window facing the backyard the husband and wife were arguing the night that she was killed was the night that she served her husband with the uh, divorce papers to letting him know that it's over, we're done. That night, the violence in the home reached new heights that even the longtime physically abused wife did not think would be possible. Alana's mom called her from Windsor and said, I'll come down with you when you serve him those papers. Because her mom had this sort of feeling that this was not going to go right. And a quote, um, the mom, what she said to me, what Alana said to her, which was, Mom, he's not going to kill me. You don't need to come from Windsor. I'm just serving him with papers. And look what happened. The morning after the murder, Dr. Mohammed Shamji went to work, acting as if everything was normal, except for one thing. So he's dumped the body, comes home. What happens now? Comes home, he makes breakfast for the kids, he takes them to school, and he goes to work, and he sees patients that day. And later on that day, he leaves a voicemail for a divorce lawyer in which he says, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, my wife wants a, uh, a divorce. I'm going to give her half of everything I got. Here's my number. Here's my name. Call me. And he hangs up the phone. The lawyer notified police about the odd call while the brilliant surgeon went about his day thinking he could get away with murder. He actually thought that he could get away with it because there are those who, you, some are so narcissistic that they think, I can talk my way out of this. No one's going to believe it's me. And I honestly believe that's what he thought, and this is why he put no thought into it. There was no trying to cover it up. He went about his day acting like everything was normal. Meanwhile, he left the suitcase exposed with his wife's body in it, with the name tag on it that comes back to the family. And he went about his day pretending as if nothing's happened. He thought he was smarter than the average bear. But the neurosurgeon was not going to get away with killing his wife, the mother of their three young children. You see, there was a witness in the house, their eldest. Shamji's 11-year-old daughter, Yasmin, woke up. The one daughter in particular, her bedroom backed onto the closet of her mom and dad. So she heard the uh, fighting that was going on. In fact, she came out of her room, stood into the entrance of her parents' room, and she saw her dad on the floor on his hands and knees. She couldn't see her mom, but she could see her dad. Her dad was between the bed and the window. So on his side, one side of the bed on the floor, I believe he was he was uh, assaulting her or choking her at that point, the, the position that the daughter described that he was in at the time. So she said, what's going on? Where's mom? 
and her father said, go back to your room, it's okay. She went back to her room, then she heard rustling in the closet, and as it turns out, he was getting a suitcase from that closet, that's exactly what his daughter heard. We are back in the car now, heading to a coffee shop on the lakeshore in Mississauga. So Steve, she's murdered on a Wednesday night. How long before you make an arrest and where do you do it? So the arrest was made Friday, December the 2nd, so roughly two days after, uh, at 7.55 p.m. right here at this Timothy's in Mississauga. And he's inside? And he went inside to speak with a, a man, yes. Let's go in. So he's in here? So he's in here. He was being surveilled. We had him under surveillance for quite some time uh, on the Friday. The doctor had been driving around with his passport and his brother, who had come up from Boston before ending up inside the coffee shop, all under the watchful eye of Toronto police. One of the surveillance officers uh, called me to say he's coming into this coffee shop and he's meeting with a, a middle-aged white guy in a suit. Immediately I thought it was his lawyer, and it was. So my concern was that he was seeking legal counsel and then he was gonna flee with his brother. So at that point, 7.55 p.m., I advised the surveillance team to arrest him, which they did. And so they come in and, and how does that work? They came in, identified themselves, they were in plain clothes, identified themselves as police officers and they arrested him for murder. And what did he say? Nothing, he didn't say a damn thing. And he would never talk to investigators, staying silent throughout the 90-minute interview with the detective. So at some point then, I decided to try to get a reaction from him. I took a picture of Alana uh, in the suitcase, badly beaten, and I slid it over to him. And I, and I said to him, I accused him of doing it, and asked him why he did it. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't even look at the picture. He didn't acknowledge me, nor the picture, but he kind of just turned away like that. He wouldn't look at it. And the picture, you've described it to me, it's awful. She's unrecognizable, actually, and that was the same picture that we had to show her, her, her parents because we needed to know definitively whether it was her or not. And unfortunately, that was a picture we had to show them, and uh, she was unrecognizable, and it was, uh, it was a very, very sad sight to see. She wanted nothing to do with the picture at all. He'd also done something to her as well, didn't he, to her hair? He did. He, her hair was, was, I wouldn't even say it was cut, it was chopped. So it was chopped on an angle. And we never got down to why that happened, but I can tell you based on my experience and just courses I've taken over the, over the years, because she was leaving him, this was almost, if I can't have you, nobody can have you sort of um, reaction. And the chop of the hair was to make her, in my view, look as ugly as he could possibly make her before she was found. And that's why he chopped, she had beautiful long, long hair and it was chopped off in such a, a, a barbaric way. It can only have been done to make her look bad. And, and the reason for that is, is just anger? Anger, just punishment, pure punishment. That's all it was. If you're, I'm going to make you look ugly, you're leaving me, nobody else is gonna want you, as ridiculous as that sounds, because she's be, gonna be buried in the ground. In the end, there would not be a murder trial. Dr. Mohammed Shamji would reach a plea deal on second degree murder and save his daughter from having to take the stand. She would have had to have testified. She was a star witness. So we had all kinds of circumstantial evidence. Plus we had her eyewitness account of what she saw. She would be the person that uh, would be the crown star witness had this gone to trial. This is why the uh, uh, plea was accepted with regards to 14 years before the uh, eligibility of parole. That was to keep the kids out of the witness box because testifying, being cross-examined by a, a skilled defense counsel is difficult for a seasoned detective, let alone a child who's going to speak against his father as to what the father did to her mother. After sentencing, I sat down with Yasmin, who was by then 14, and asked her how she felt about her father, now convicted of murdering her mother. Hatred. I hate him. Honestly. It's, yeah, I'm angry. I'm just more so scared and sad than angry as well. There were three children in the house that night, including Yasmin's sister, Faiza, who was eight at the time. I think, where did he go wrong? Like, when did he think that it was okay to do that? Like, 
what was his thought process when he was doing what he did? Like, what made him think that it was okay to do that? Shamsi's children, two girls and a young boy, now live with Alana's mother and father in Windsor. Standing in the prisoner's box, his hands cuffed behind his back, Mohammed Shamji looked at his mother-in-law, Anna Frick, who pointed to her two granddaughters and said, look at them, look at them. Steve Ryan calls the grandmother, Anna. So, Anna, um, how are you doing? You know, now we're doing much better because we try to put everything behind us. And uh, not that we forgot what happened. We will never forget that. But for our own, but for our own sakes, we gotta go on and live our life. How are the kids doing? The children doing very well. Thank you for asking. Steve made this phone call the day after Mother's Day. They're doing very well, very well. Well. But of course, like yesterday was a Mother's Day, okay? It was a rainy day here in the Windsor, but still, we went to cemetery. The children brought her to cake uh, flowers to the mom grave, you know? They're hurt because they have to grow all their, all their life with no mom. Right. And they, they are still young to understand that that uh, their life will be with no mother, okay? And they're hurting them when they go in the school and everybody talking about their mom and this and that, and they don't have no mom in their life. That's their life, but otherwise they're doing just fine. They're very happy children and they're doing very well. Well, a lot of that has to do with you and your husband. They're very lucky to have uh, to have well, you guys. you know what? It's, they have lots of love with us. They got lots of respect. They got freedom. They got sleepovers and all that stuff that the children are supposed to have in their age. Nothing like before when the father never allowed them to have anything, not even friends in their house. So controlling, their grandmother says, that their father would not let his children even have friends over to play in their home. Anna, do they talk about their dad at all? Never. They don't like to talk about. They do talk sometimes, you know, oh, you remember when we went out and we have this and that, you know, and our father said that and that, but um, nothing in a positive way, you know. They, they despise it, to be really honest. What is frustrating for the former homicide investigator is that the abuse was well known in Dr. Alana Frick Shamsi's circle of friends and colleagues. The 40 year old mother was a respected and well liked family physician. All of her friends, all of them doctors, highly educated, successful people, at the height of their careers as well, they knew or suspected that she was being physically abused by her husband and they said nothing. So, physical abuse, domestic abuse has no limits. It doesn't matter if you're poor, uneducated, or you're lots of money, highly educated. People react the same way, and that is to say, it's none of my business. I don't want nothing to do with it. But if you speak out, you are not being a, a, a rat. You are actually um, perhaps saving somebody who may be stuck in a spot where they don't know what to do. And unfortunately, nobody spoke out and let, let it be known that uh, she was being abused as badly as she was. I'm Austin Delaney.